Good afternoon, my friends. Happy Wednesday. The doctor is in the house. Welcome back to another episode of To Your Health with Dr. G on this great day. I tell you what, I'm so excited. Today, we're just bringing the thunder like we always bring it every week here on the show. You know what? We're kicking off my second annual Hashtag Cancer Sucks series. And I've got a great group of friends and colleagues here to me with me today to help break this down. I tell you what, last year we broke up, broke down uh, cancer. We did breast cancer, colon cancer, and lung cancer last year. We also actually did prostate cancer, just remembering that right now. So it's a, it was a year ago, can you believe it? And so we're gonna continue this series going on, but talking about making sure that we create awareness, we promote better education, and we have these conversations. Cancer's a tough topic to talk about. It's uncomfortable at times, but we have to have those honest conversations. At the end of the day, we as physicians, we want you to have the best health, which will translate into your best life. But we have to have these conversations and acknowledge some of the challenges that we face when it comes to our own human survival. And I tell you what, today is such a special day because today is a milestone show. It's number 60. It's excellent. So I'll give myself a little golf clap there. Oh, thank you guys. Thank you guys. And I tell you what, uh, this, none of this would be possible without my wife, Tiffany E.R. Gomez, who's been literally the, the force behind all this to your health with Dr. G, helping me do everything that we can do for just, just getting the show out there and just sharing this common vision. So, babe, I love you. This is awesome. We're going to keep it going. And I tell you what, this topic today on brain tumors, and today's topic is called uh, uh, Hashtag Cancer Sucks Part 1 Brain Tumors. We're going to break it down for the next couple of weeks. We're doing brain tumors today. Next week we'll be doing ovarian cancer. The week after that we'll be doing pancreatic cancer. But this topic sits home with me. It sits home with me because I'll tell you my story in a bit about me having been diagnosed with a brain tumor in 2011. But you're here we are today. We're going to keep this conversation uplifting. We're not trying to get sad or anything like that. You know, we want to make sure you have the right information. You guys are checking us out here. We're live in studio at Intellectual Radio. We're live on Facebook. Check me out on my website, www.drmarkgomez.com. And I tell you what, we're going to have this conversation, but we have to do this. And I tell you what, those of you that are out there today listening to us, make sure that you share this show. This conversation cannot end today. We're talking about a topic for this next couple of weeks, but every show that we do, we want to make sure that people get the right information. We're all about building trust and delivering truth. So we're going to break down brain tumors. So before we meet my guests and everything today, I want to just kind of give you guys a quick shout out. And thank you for tuning in again on the show. And before I start any show, i got to hit you with a quick disclaimer. The content of To Your Health with Dr. G, I always do that. The content of To Your Health with Dr. G is for informational and entertainment purposes only, and that the content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, and or treatment. Further details can be found at www.toyourhealthwithdrg.com slash disclaimer. So here we are today. We're talking about brain tumors and how the show is going to work. We're going to give you guys some overviews of what we're talking about here. We're going to talk about some of the more common things. We're going to talk some statistics, who gets it. You know, we're going to just talk about just our daily interaction with things. And I'm going to tell my story, and I'm sure my colleagues have some stories to tell on what they see in day, day in and day out. And also, of course, towards the end of the show, we're going to break down myths versus facts because we want you guys to go home today with the right information. And again, we talk about there's a lot of misinformation about there. So with this show, every week on the show, we try to set the record straight, just tell the truth. And I always try to tell it to my patients all the time. I want them to be truthful with me, and I'll be truthful with them back at it. But again, we're all about uplifting each other to have a good healthy, long life for you and your family. So without further ado, I want to introduce my guests. I've known these gentlemen for a long time. We all work together. That's all right. We all work together at Edward Hospital, um, and uh, they've seen a ton of my patients. Uh, they're, they're, they're the consummate pros at what they do. They're experts in their craft, and they're all about making sure that you have all the tools to have success with what you're doing in your health and in your life. So I want to introduce my first guest. He's sitting immediately to my right. I've known him since days at Loyola. Uh, so I want to introduce him, and I'll have him, have him tell, help tell you about his, about his bio and everything in a few moments. But I want to introduce my good friend, Dr. William Broderick. He's a board-certified hematologist-oncologist. He's also co-medical director of the Edward Multidisciplinary Neuro-Oncology Clinic at Edward Elmer's Health. Check them out, www.eehealth.org. Dr. Broderick, welcome to the show. Thanks, Mark. Good to be here. Please tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us about where you did your medical school, where you did some of your training, and maybe a few words about what does this theme of brain tumors mean to you? All righty. Well, um, as Mark mentioned, we've known each other for quite a while from our days back at Loyola. I, uh, 
I am a proud graduate of, graduate of the University of Notre Dame. I can't, wouldn't be a domer if I didn't mention that. I've had some, oh, I I've had some Notre Dame uh, people uh, on my show. I know. <laughs> Any Washington people out there? D3, yeah. There you All go. Right. Uh, from there, uh, Loyola Medical School, and uh, went into the Air Force for my residency. I uh, did my residency in uh, San Antonio, Texas at Lackland Air Force Base. Uh, three years there, and then four years uh, serving my country in the United States Air Force as an internal medicine physician. Finished my service there, and then back to Loyola for my fellowship in hematology and oncology. And while I was there, developed a special interest in brain tumors. Came out to Edward uh, and uh, practiced both hematology and oncology at Edward. Uh, with a little focus uh, on brain tumors. Excellent. Well, thank you. It's been great. I'm so glad. Yes, I, I met you when you were actually back in your fellowship mm -hmm. at Loyola. So, uh, so, but that's what a what a world round tour. But also bringing it back home and something that you're passionate about today. So, thank you, Dr. Prada. We're going to talk more in detail in a few moments. My next guest, he and I know each other for multiple years too. We worked together at Edward Hospital. Um, he's seen a ton of my patients. Just a, a fantastic gentleman, uh, pro at what he does. And, uh, and I just can't say enough about my good friend, uh, Dr. Bill Schuller, Dr. William Schuller, let me read his credentials. Dr. Bill Schuller, he's a board certified neurosurgeon with Edward Elmer's Health. Check him out at www.eehealth.org. Dr. Schuller, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. Hey, you bet. Please tell us your background. Tell us a little where you did your medical school, where you did your training, um, and really uh, what does esteem mean to you today? Okay, fair enough. Uh, well, I'm an Illinois kid. I grew up in western suburbs of Chicago. I'm from the Roselle. Uh, did uh, undergraduate down at the University of Illinois, down in Champaign, Urbana, so go Illini. Uh, <laughs> from there, medical school was at Rush in Chicago, and then I got my residency in neurosurgery uh, down at the University of Oklahoma, so I spent my residency there, and then I stayed on as faculty there for two and a half years teaching residents how to operate, and then we started having babies, and that brought us home because we needed help, so. <laughs> and, uh, Came moved uh, back, moved to Naperville and been at Edward ever since and you know, know you guys and yeah. that's where we set up set of practice you know we're the three the, there's three neurosurgeons out there we're all employed by Northwestern but we're stationed at Edward and we all enjoy the the camaraderie and we're all part of the neuro oncology um, meet, uh, tumor board that we have every week uh, at Edward so it's a good thing and tumorism to me in general just it's something that actually all three of us like to do but all all of us surgeons here we, we like operating on brain yes. tumors you know, we want what's best for our patients. You know, and depending on, you know, we cater to what we need to do, so. Excellent. But that's something we all enjoy. You know, I went into neurosurgery, I like doing brain tumors, you know, but it, the practice at Edward, you know, we have a little bit of everything, so we do yeah. spine and brain, but all this kind of a little deep, deep liking for brain tumors. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Dr. Schuler. It's great to have you on the show. So how's the show, how the show works? Again, you guys just met the expert panels. They are fierce, <laughs> the panelists, and, and really it's true, because they are. So how it works, of course, I'm going to ask them questions about things, but again, we're trying to get you guys the right information so you can have this kind of conversation. You know, we're trying to set the record straight on what we're talking about today on brain tumors. Again, we're part of this overall hashtag cancer suck series, and really to make sure that you have the right information. If anything comes up, talk to your doctor. All three of us here will say, listen, if you have questions, talk to your physician. Your physician will, will save you at the end, end of the day. They'll be there to hear your story. Anything that comes up, and I tell you what, when it comes to us being as physicians here, you know, there's no such thing as crying wolf when it comes to your health. You know, it's your health. You're invested in it, and it's part of your health journey. Your part of your health journey is part of your broader life journey. If something's going on, we all would say, come get seen. You know, we'd rather tell you that nothing's going on, nothing serious is going on, and give you that reassurance versus something that's delayed and, uh, and, uh, and the challenges that are out there may be limited. That's so, true. yeah, so, so what I want to do today is, again, uh, have these guys here tell us a little bit more about brain tumors. So here it is, the question of the hour. We call it the chief complaint. The chief complaint, of course, is when somebody comes into your office and says what they're doing here for, why are they there, and that's the chief complaint of medicine. The question of the hour that we're talking about today is, what causes brain tumors to develop? How can the risk be minimized? And what treatment options are available? That's actually three questions. That's like three questions of the hour. I said one question of the hour. That's plural. Sorry about that, guys. I usually only have one thing, but it works out well. But we want to really set the record straight on what's going on again about brain tumors and creating more awareness so we can forge ahead. So first question here for Dr. Dr. Broderick. Dr. Broderick, can you just give us a little bit of overview of brain tumors? Um, you know, how do brain tumors develop? Uh, just generally speaking, we don't have to get into like the specific kinds per se, because there's a, certainly a diversity of uh, brain tumors, a lot of them. <laughs> um, but like generally speaking, what are we talking about as far as the development of brain tumors, benign and malignant? Well, so tumors in general are uh, cells in our bodies that have gained a competitive advantage over our normal cells and are growing out of control. And really can happen with any 
individual type of cell anywhere in the body. Um, the brain is no exception. So we, each of the different tissues in the brain can grow out of control and grow into a tumor. Um, and so uh, really the development is, can be fast, can be slow, depends on the tissue, depends upon the type of tumor, and uh, can be either benign or malignant, cancerous, uh, depending upon its location and how it's growing. I tell you what, one of the things that we talk about with, with brain tumors, I, I know it doesn't get the same um, the same attention as it does to uh, things like you know breast cancer uh, um, or other forms of cancer. Uh, so brain tumors, and, and maybe it's because you know statistically, you know we're seeing so many more diagnoses every year of other kind of cancers. But the reality is that that hundreds of thousands of people in this country are living with brain tumors as we're talking about, yeah. whether benign or mal or malignant. Doctor Doctor Schuler, what's your take on just kind of the the the, the just the the general statistics of brain tumors, you know, how common are you seeing this kind of thing? How common is it in the population mm -hmm. uh, when you talk about benign or malignant tumors? So, I mean, it's getting more and more common with metastatic disease where people who have disease elsewhere are you know, living longer or doing well with that. And so people with metastatic disease are getting, you know, tumors we didn't think originally metastasized to the brain are actually metastasized to the brain now. So we're seeing more and more of that. But in general, yeah. Brain tumors don't get as much discussion because they're not quite as common as, say, you know, breast cancer, prostate, yeah. colon. Yeah. And there's no screening test for it either. It's not like, you know, we can, you know, do a colonoscopy or yeah. whatever. And, the, you know, doing CAT scans or MRIs just for the willy-nilly, that doesn't pay out. So, you know, it's 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 there. We treat them all the time. and uh, But, yeah, they're not as popular and they're not as common as the other ones. But with, you know, like see people living longer with cancer, we're seeing more and more metastases. But that doesn't say that primary brain tumors aren't going away either. We still see quite a bit about that. So. Can I can I pick you back in on that one? You sure. mentioned primary brain tumors. Yeah. So can you explain what a primary uh, brain okay. tumor is? So a primary brain tumor is a tumor from brain tissue. So you have neurons and glia and a bunch of different types of cells inside your brain. But you know the one most people will hear about is called as a GBM or glioblastoma multiforme. And that's actually from the brain so t tissue itself, the neurons. You know, causing a, a you know growing and it's actually a really bad tumor. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's the most common tumor that. Uh, from a primary brain tumor. Yes, thank so, you. You know, I think about I think about you know it's just the reality that we want to try to create more awareness about something going on. You know, I, I if those of you that have been following me on social media this week, I shared my story that back in 2011, I was diagnosed with a pituitary tumor uh, that thankfully was benign. Uh, but my I actually presented you right. There's really no other no. We'll talk about some okay. symptoms if there are some symptoms. But how mine was diagnosed was that I had a case of Bell's palsy. And during my work with just the Bell's palsy, wound up getting an MRI, and, and they said, okay, well, by the way, you know, your, your cranial nerves are fine, but by the way, there's a 3.2 centimeter pituitary macroadenoma sitting in there. And uh, that happened to be about a, about a week and a half before my one-year wedding anniversary. Mm -hmm. And so uh, my wife and I honestly were just shocked uh, by sure, the news. Yeah. My wife was also in her last trimester of our <laughs> the oh, pricing for my daughter, yeah. for our daughter and everything. <laughs> Uh, so what, what wound up happening is, is of course, you know, I had to basically, I, never, I had never been a patient in the medical system, and so I basically became a patient and wound up seeing an endocrinologist, wound up seeing a neurosurgeon, wound up seeing my internist to, to get cleared, and within about 10 days of my diagnosis, what, uh, I wound up having surgery, and that surgery uh, to, to basically remove the pituitary tumor took place just a few days before my one-year wedding anniversary. And if I, if my memory serves me right, I got out of the hospital on my anniversary. So, uh, which is great because I was able to sleep in my own bed. And I think when I remember at that time, I was like the healthiest person walking around the neuro ICU. Probably were. And, uh, and, and, and it's funny. I, I, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dr. Schiller, Dr. Schiller didn't comment on that one. He knows when people are, are able to ambulate or not able to ambulate in the neuro ICU. And I'm like, there I was. I was uh, barely in my 30s. I think it was 33 at the time of that diagnosis, and uh, and basically uh, walking around the unit like I own the place, I guess, <laughs> uh, which was which was great. But I'm very grateful for uh, my surgeon at the time. I want to give a shout out to Dr. Gail Rousseau, who was just an amazing individual who uh, really saved my life. And so when we were coming up with this idea of the show, this show is very 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 um, very personal to me. Since that diagnosis, of course, you become an expert when you get when you suffer something yourself. You become an expert in that. And so, there's been countless cases that I've seen of people that have come in and just kind of a similar kind of presentation, no no real symptoms per se, uh, but then they wind up we want to do some neuroimaging. They wind up having a, a mass scene. Uh, so let me ask this to Dr. Broderick. You know, somebody's coming in with like you know 
my, my, my presentation, my unique presentation was a case of Bell's palsy, uh, but uh, that had nothing to do with the nothing to do with the tumor itself. But uh, are there any kind of symptoms that people may have? If they're coming in with like a brain cancer, brain tumor, um, anything that's out there? Yeah, um, it's it's tough because a lot of the brain tumors are asymptomatic people with, with no symptoms, um, but f and frequently we see patients present either with signs or symptoms that we would usually associate with a stroke, weakness, numbness, tingling, um, changes in their vision, um, seizures is a common presentation. Um, oftentimes people, we see people who hit their head and get a CAT scan for, or something for, yep. like, you know, for an entirely separate reason, like yourself, um, and we find these things incidentally. Um, you, you'll notice I didn't really mention headache. Um, headaches are a symptom of brain tumors, but when you talk about, you know, for example, a typical inc incidence that qu that's quoted is uh, 30 brain tumors per 100,000 people. Well, those 100,000 people all have headaches at some point in their lives, and only 30 of them turned out to have brain tumors. And so, um, while headache is a symptom of tumor, uh, what we tend to talk about are people who have headaches that have a change in pattern. For example, had migraines your whole life, but this is really different. Um, worst headache of your life is another warning sign. Um, uh, but you know your average day-to-day -day headache um, goes away the next day is not typically a symptom of, of brain tumors. Very well. Dr. Shula, let me ask you this question, because from a surgeon's standpoint, you know, by the time people see you, yes, they have, they have, the, they have the mass in the brain, um, and they're basically seeing you to see whether or not they're a surgical candidate or other kind of treatments that are out there. Right. Explain, explain a little bit further the role that you play in the management of overall brain tumors, whether primary or even secondary brain tumors. What, what's the general role of a neurosurgeon in this process? So, uh, yeah, most, most people, once they're diagnosed with a tumor get, you know, in the brain, get sent to a neurosurgeon for evaluation. Uh, in our instance, we try to see everybody on our tumor board, and so we have a discussion in our tumor board. We have our neuroradiologists, we have our radiation oncologists, we have our neuro-oncologists. We also have our neurosurgeons there, and so we, you know, have it as a discussion. Now, not always we meet once a week, so sometimes people come in during the week as well, and we'll have something. But, you know, our role is trying to figure out what's the best treatment option for the patient. So, you know, if someone comes in with a small meningioma, so that's a tumor co from the coverings of the brain, well, they're 95% of the time, they're benign. And most times they're too small to really, you know, to come in, people find them incidentally, so there's not really a rush them off to surgery. But, you know, it's our role to you know, watch them and see how they grow and discuss with the patient, hey, these are our options. You know, we can watch it, we can radiate, we can take it out. But for you right now, this is small, we don't need to do anything. Let's watch it and we'll get another scan in six months and move it out over time. But if it's something that looks aggressive or looks something else, like, no, hey, this needs to come out, you know, we need to do surgery, then we got to come up with a plan of what's the best surgery for that patient. There's, there's a lot of different ways to do things, too. And so, uh, and with, with new technologies, we, we're adding things every day. Like, I don't know how your tumor was taken out, you know, your pituitary, but nowadays we're doing it with an endoscope and a, yeah. uh, and a little um, re uh, resection tool. But, you know, they used to do it, they'd pull your lip up and make a big cavity underneath their lip. And I've actually seen those during residency. That's a big surgery. Yeah. But today, with just up the nose, it's a lot quicker and easier on the patient. So. I, I tell you what, I tell you what, Bill, when I have mine out, I, you know, it's so funny because I think about my days as a medical student. Yeah, they make the incision under your lip and make a big old cavity. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, and, and I kept thinking to myself, Please, has technology advanced <laughs> since I had mine done? And I tell you what, I was lucky that I had mine done through my nose right, um, with a laparoscopic approach. And mine was a two-part procedure. I know you work with hand-in-hand -hand with the, your nose with Botox to kind of work their way up. And then you go ahead and take over. It's almost like you slap hands. All right, you're, in, you're up next <laughs> uh, kind of thing. Tag, you're it. Um, and I described it. And so when I tell some of my, my patients my story, they always say, they're looking at my head. They're like, I don't see anything right. on your head. <laughs> you had brain surgery? Yeah. I go, what if I told you they took the biggest booger ever <laughs> in chunks? Right. Uh, and that's what kind of what it was. And so uh, I got over my fear of, of enclosed spaces, by the way, at that time. Yeah. After having, like, I don't know, I've had probably a dozen MRIs, uh, maybe 15 MRIs right. uh, since then. But uh, but I got over my fear of enclosed spaces, so it's certainly possible. And also, it's also called Valium. That'll help you out, too, <laughs> on a way to get, a, get, a fear of, get over your fear of enclosed spaces. But anyways, so uh, so we're talking here about brain tumors. I want to break down a little more of the statistics. So I want to pull, I pulled some stuff from the um, the National Brain Tumor Society, because I want to hit that record home uh, set up here. It's at National Brain Tumor Society, www.braintumor.org. So I said earlier, 700 
10,000 Americans are living with a brain tumor. 69.1%, so almost 7% are benign, 30% are malignant. Uh, this year is estimated that almost 87,000 people in this country will receive a primary brain tumor diagnosis. Um, and and of, that, of that almost 87,000, 60,000 plus will be benign, 26,000 plus will be malignant. Uh, and then the average survival rate for all malignant brain tumors is only 35%. And that might be a five-year point. I'm not too sure. I might have to clarify that. Thank you. Clarify that five-year survival rate. Uh, well, that's all malignant cancer. Uh, yeah. okay. it's, so it's not that good for, for the GBM. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, that's, that's, some are not that good, good unfortunately. Yeah. And we'll talk about GBM in, in a moment well, because that, that's, uh, <laughs> that certainly has, has been in the in the public sphere because of uh, many famous people that have had that diagnosis. Uh, median age of diagnosis, age 60. Uh, and then an estimated 16,000 plus people will die from a malignant brain tumor this year. So we're talking about numbers. Now, they're just, they're, they're numbers, but the numbers tell a story on that we need to do more. Um, and we're going to get into like kind of where we think things might be going in the future because where we've seen some of the evolution right now, I mean, yes, the surgical techniques have, have improved and Dr. Broder can certainly talk about some of the, the chemotherapeutic options or even some radiation options that are out there that weren't there years ago, but, but, but the reality is that we still have uh, very high numbers, and we obviously, as physicians, of course, want numbers to go down. So let me ask this question to, to Dr. Broderick. Well, you know, when we think about adults, you know, I mentioned my case. I was in my early 30s at the time, my pituitary. Mm -hmm. Is there, are there different, like, um, types of brain tumors that depend on the age that somebody is that you might see more, like, in someone in their 30s versus someone in their 60s or anything like that? Uh, well, there is a general... Um it's interesting because there's a general uh, increase in the number of tumors as as the population ages. Um, as far as younger versus older, the pituitaries um, we do tend to see in younger populations. Older populations we tend to see uh, more the um, the astrocytomas, yeah. the GBMs, um, the more aggressive sort of primary invasive brain tumors. Um, and in geomas um, we see a fair number of mini mini geomas in young women and mm -hmm. then a second group of in uh, as the population ages as well all right excellent you know I, I think about some of these when somebody gets that diagnosis and i know for me i was kind of in complete shock on things and everything um but let me ask dr Shua this question you know say people come into your office you know they're coming in to see you as a neurosurgeon and you're they already know the diagnosis by the time they're coming in to see you that they have they have a mass in the brain right. and we're still going to do more workup of course but what are some questions that, that you wish, that you want people to ask you? Um, you know, because sometimes it's hard to have those kind of questions. <laughs> right. You know, you're sitting there and, and, you know, I want to spend as much time with my patients as much as possible. Uh, uh, but, but, but we know that, you know, you can't spend 24 hours with somebody. But, but what are the pertinent questions that, that, that you would like to hear from patients? Or, or let me flip the script. What are some things that you want to tell patients when they're sitting there in your chair? Well, you know, everybody wants to know if this is malignant or not. That's the first question you always get. And unfortunately, quite often on MRI, you can kind of tell if it's encapsulated, it looks benign, looks like it's come from the dura, or it looks like a, it doesn't look aggressive. But even stuff that looks aggressive sometimes is not actually as aggressive as it is, and things that are not aggressive. So, you know, if people want to know what's malignant or benign, there's no way to know that until we actually have a piece of it. So, uh, um, but from that, yeah, it's just, you know, are, are we comfortable doing it? Is this something you can access? What, what, how, how are you going to attack this? And what are we going to do as a group? And I tell them, hey, this, you don't have just me as the doctor here. Yeah, I might be the one performing the surgery, but I've got a team, you know, an ICU that's awesome over at Edward. And we've got the whole neuro team, you know, with, you know like I said, Dr. Yeah, Broderick and my radiation yeah. doctors and my other neurosurgeons. And, like, we actually will go in each other's cases when we're operating. We operate right next to each other. And I, if we need some help or just to, you know, run things off each other. And the other day, one of my colleagues was... Asking about approach on the tumor he's doing on Friday. It's like, yeah, I would do it this way. Oh, yeah, I would do it this way. So we have a lot of camaraderie. It's nice to know that people know that we have a team. And then, you know, we're involved with Northwestern too. And so sometimes, you know, hey, I've got a colleague downtown that does research on this particular thing. I can take you downtown, do it with him, and have all your care back at Edwards so you're close. You're not driving all over the place, but we can do some research, you know, and help the whole community out with the research as well. So it's a that's a great opportunity as well, but people are just asking me when they come in, just the main thing they want to is malignant that's or benign, and they're just, I can't tell them that, I can tell you the odds, but, uh, but you know, just, you know, how you, how's it going to affect, I like to know how long it's going to take to recover and all that, and I, I go over all those things, because, okay, you, you know, you're, you're usually not ICU a day or two, and then you're at home and recovering, and some people need rehab, rehab depending on where it's located. I mean, the big thing for people is kind of give them an idea of where this is located and what I'm going to affect by going in after it. Yeah. That's, that, you know, that's the, and that's, I like to explain that to people. 
So that's, you know, that's, those are some of the questions. Well, those are the, you know, it's interesting because I always talk about, you know, as physicians, you know, we, number one, we, we, we've taken an oath uh, and we want to do no harm. Of course, but we want to tell our patients the truth. Right. And, and I think you have to, you have to tell the truth. And sometimes it's hard to talk about that, even, you know, because there's a human component. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to follow up a question with Dr. Broderick on this one, but the human component is real because we feel and we've seen things, not only as physicians, but also family members that we have. Mm -hmm. We've been through experiences, and then you're having a conversation with somebody that you may have known for a long time, and you tell them the diagnosis. It's hard to have that conversation. So let me ask this question to Dr. Broderick. You know, being an oncologist, a cancer doc, how do you approach this having conversations with patients on maybe a difficult diagnosis, a difficult topic as brain tumors, whether it's benign, or, but certainly if it's malignant? Mm -hmm. Well, um, the first thing that I always tell my patients, and the line that I use is, I, I don't pull any punches with my patients. Um, this is it's a serious situation. We have a serious diagnosis, to, and we have there are life-altering decisions that need to be made. And so, um, I consider 50% of my job, maybe even more than 50% of my job, explaining to the patient what's going on. How did this grow? How? Why did? Why do I have these symptoms? Why was, you know, I have a neighbor where the whole tumor was cut out. Why could I only get part of the tumor mm -hmm. cut out? You know, explaining the situation that we're in and the facts, hopefully in terms that they can understand. Um, trying to avoid as much of the medical jargon. Yes. And with that, unfortunately, we kind of get into when we have conversations right. among yeah. ourselves. We and we, <laughs> we, um, so um, so that that's usually sets the stage, and then I, I talk about the tissue that the, diet, that the uh, tumor came from. Um, we don't talk about staging of brain tumors. Um, we talk about uh, grading, so how aggressive it looks. So I describe how um, a low-grade tumor looks very much like normal brain tissue. A high-grade tumor, sometimes it's so bad that when you look at it, unless somebody, unless Dr. Schuler labels it brain, you don't know what came out of the brain. Gotcha. Fair enough. Um, gotcha. And so I explain what all that means, and then so that they understand where we're starting from. And then before we even get into talking about treatments and things along those lines, um, and then we talk about, I try to lay out a plan of action, and then... We have to talk about prognosis yeah. and where we're going. Well, I think you're, you're absolutely right to have that conversation, uh, which can be difficult again, but we have to have that conversation. Um, we're talking about health. And, and I, and certainly me, having gone through, I tell you what, the way how I practice medicine now, having been on the side, you know, and I'm, I'm trying to say, like, all doctors need to be patients, but it gives you a whole other perspective on what it's like to be in, in the other side. You know, we're there in the room with our white coats on, and, you know, you're not sitting in the chair. And you start sitting in the chair, you start thinking a whole bunch of things, right. and so it, it humbles you. But at the same time, it, get, it seems like it gave me a lot of perspective when I had my diagnosis. But it also made me want to continue to advocate more for people, uh, and, and getting people into the door uh, uh, more quickly for just not just even brain tumors in general, but just for just general health. You know, I always say on the show, I always say uh, once a year you go see your internist, go see your primary care doc, get your physical. And I've said that many times right. at the minimum. And then integrate yourself back into your life. It only takes 15, 30, 15 to 30 minutes to see your interns, get your labs done, get your foundation, and then go back to what's in life. Again, we're talking about your health journey being part of your life journey, but that health and that life are very much interconnected. So let me ask this question. I want to ask this question to uh, Dr. Sh Dr. Schuler. Uh, do we see more um, brain tumors? You know, we, we mentioned a little bit some you said meningiomas in women. Yeah. Uh, more so women men versus men, but are there any kind of demographics there for brain tumors for like men versus women, um, uh, race, you know, Caucasian, uh, Latino, African American, do we see like any kind of trends on these kind of diagnoses? Actually, not really, not too many. I mean, meningiomas is clear, that's middle-aged women, they, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, female hormones cause them to grow, and that's, that's the thought, you know, the thought there, but in general, it, it's like a 50-50 men and women getting, you know, cancer, they're up across all races. There's not really a race that gets one thing over another, especially when it comes to brain tumors. Uh, so it really is not a whole bit, you know, the pediatric brain tumors are a little different than adult brain tumors. Kids get a little, you know, more common, what's called a posterior fossa tumor, which is in the lower part of your brain. But, you know, adults usually get more stuff that's above what we call the tentorium, which divides your upper brain and lower brain. But uh, in that case, you know, that's a little bit of a difference. But in general, like sex to sex and race to race, they're pretty, con they're pretty similar across the board. There's really not a big difference other than, I said, the meningiomas are probably the most 
common thing because women, definitely more, more women than men. Well, thank you for explaining that basically brain tumors do not discriminate. Yeah. They do not. Uh, without a doubt. When we see, is, which is interesting, when I was doing some of my research and prep for the show, you know, when I was reading about that, I was like, wow. You know, because we think about certainly other risks, other groups being at risk for, you know, you think about diabetes, heart disease, there's some predilections for, for certain groups and certain ages and stuff. But, but I agree when I'm reading more about brain tumors, it's like, wow. But this is more reason why we have to talk about this, because people may not know. That's why we have to talk about these kind of topics. So let me ask this question to Dr. To Dr. Broderick. Um, you know, treatment that's out there, generally speaking, uh, from an oncology standpoint, you know, what are we looking at for people, generally speaking? I know, sure. obviously, yeah. we're not giving out tons of advice. <laughs> you got to see your doctor. I read that disclaimer right. earlier. Go see your doctor. But, like, generally speaking, what, what are people getting into when they have um, a diagnosis of a, of, a, of a brain tumor, and certainly when it comes to, like, a, malign a malignancy? Yeah, so the, the most important, um, in my mind, the most important thing is that you have a multidisciplinary approach, we call it. So most brain tumors are going to require at least input from a surgeon, a radiation doctor, and potentially an, um, a medical oncologist or a neuro-oncologist. And so the way we approach it at Edward is that we get those that group of people together every Tuesday morning, we have a conference, and then we see clinic together. Yep. So yeah. our patients come and see us, they see their surgeon, their radiation doctor, and their oncologist all the same day. It's a long morning, uh, especially if we see the new consults before the conference and then they sit around and wait while we have the conference and then come back for the multidisciplinary right. opinion. Um, but, you know, surgeons are required. We, we need to get a diagnosis. There's only one way for most of these tumors mm -hmm. to get a diagnosis and that's to get a piece of it. And our surgery <laughs> colleagues are the only, yeah. I can't go, that, go in there and do that for you. Um, and frequently, the tumors can be removed. And with a lot of tumors, especially some of the, the more aggressive tumors, the more you get out, the better. Um, so a skilled neurosurgeon is very important. Um, but you also, a lot of these tumors require radiation um, as part of the care. And interestingly enough, the oncologist is actually the Johnny-come-lately for the, for the brain tumors because the brain does a wonderful job protecting itself from chemicals. There's, yes, a, there's a tight junction between the blood vessels and the brain tissue called the blood-brain barrier. And for a long time, we didn't have any chemotherapy agents that could cross it. So from a brain tumor standpoint, the oncologist was handcuffed. Mm -hmm. we, we, there was nothing we could do. Now, more recently, we've got a lot of agents that can cross the blood-brain barrier, get into these tumors, and help patients quite a bit. And so the oncologist's role is actually growing in the brain tumor world. Um, which is very very satisfying for me actually yeah. you know in the last 10 to 15 years when i've been doing brain tumors has been a very exciting time because some of these agents have come online and we've been able to help people with them wonderful thank you for sharing that you know that a little bit of the history about that because i do remember some of those cases at loyola you know but by the time people my patients are seeing you i'm kind of sitting on the sidelines kind of thing but yeah i remember cases being hand you know i love that word handcuffed because you couldn't really do much when you got to these kind of diagnoses, but now you can do some more. Uh, so let me ask this question to Dr. Schuler. Uh, you know, we're taking, you know, we're talking brain tumors. I want to just take it back even more general. Let's get just basic. Sure. Um, I'm going to change the script a little bit. And again, you guys are listening here. We're watching live on Facebook. We're here in the <laughs> studios at Intellectual Radio. And so let's just get basic. Like, are there things that we can do to just lower our cancer risk? And I'm just talking generally. Uh, you know, what do we need to do to, to just lower cancer risk? As a population, well, um, being in general just a doc, you yeah. stop smoking, yeah. right? Yeah. That, that is like yes. number one, <laughs> one. Yeah. without a doubt, yeah. <laughs> the worst thing you can do for yourself. It just, it's harmful. There's nothing good comes from it. But uh, other than that, I mean, anything in moderation is pretty good. I mean, you, know, you get scared about a cell phone for your having causing a brain tumor. That's never been proven. It's likely not the cause. <laughs> you know, if you got. You know, we do know that, you know, kids with pediatric brain tumors, well, they got them treated, but they got a lot of radiation. We know that can cause tumors down the road, but that's a lot of radiation to your brain. Uh, but, yeah, in general, just, you know, living a fairly healthy life and, and anything in moderation is okay. But the big thing, yeah, I would say smoking, yeah. like from an oncologist yeah. standpoint, then you guys deal with that a little bit more. Yeah. Dr. Broderick, give us a little more just general recommendations yeah. just for yeah. cancer risk, lowering it from a general perspective. Um, you know, yeah. maintaining a healthy body in general. Healthy food exercise, avoid toxins, right? You know, and that, that you know, that, that's across the board that helps in just maintain a healthy body. A lot, of, um, a lot of cancer survival is whether or not you can tolerate the treatments. They're hard, 
right? And so if your body is healthy going into these things, um, you know, from a brain tumor standpoint, specific standpoint, there's not a lot that we know about avoiding brain tumors. For a long time, people wanted to blame the, the cell phones. Yeah. It's been proven it's not the cell phones. So we're, you know, we don't really know the underlying cause. We don't know what we can do to avoid them. So keep your body healthy. Um, you know, but there are a lot of toxins in our environment that we can't avoid. Um, so avoid the ones you can. You know, alcohol in moderation. Avoid the cigarette smoke. Avoid the vapes. Uh, yes, and I did a vaping show. Check out, <laughs> check it out on www.drmarkowens.com. We did a vaping show a few months ago, just destroying the concept of vapes. Got to do the other thing is just do your general screening. You know, follow right. the doctor once, you know, once a year. Do your colonoscopy. Do your you know, other tests that they do. Now we talk about age-appropriate cancer-related right. cancer yep. screening that you got to get done. So if you're behind, you got to get done. But the only way to know what your risk is at is to go talk to your doctor and see what you, you're due for. There's plenty of times where a doctor can get you caught up on things that can hopefully help prevent you from getting something in the first place. You know, interesting statistic out there by the CDC that was published, I believe, in 2005. Uh, but they basically said, and, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but if we did the things that we're supposed to do, you know, exercise, <laughs> eat right, control our stressors, and not smoking, we would we would prevent 40% of cancers. Oh, also, you prevent 80% of heart disease, 80% of diabetes. Um, and the reality is that we have a rising chronic disease burden in this country um, that's really taken off and costing, you know, billions and billions of dollars every year on things that could be prevented through a healthy lifestyle. And same thing goes here, please, Dr. Brother. Yeah, and also, know your family history. Talk to your family. Um, you know, they're especially not necessarily with brain tumors, but with the other cancers, colon cancer, breast cancer. If it's prevalent in your family, your doctor needs to know about it. And know, and the doctors, your doctor can now recognize patterns because we're seeing, you know, patterns of different malignancies that can run in the family in parallel. And uh, so that's another, uh, another important aspect to maintaining your health. Excellent. So let's talk about this. Let's talk about a couple of the topics I want to do before we get into myths versus facts. Um, let's talk about, I want to come back to a little bit earlier, we talked about uh, uh, glioblast glioblastoma multiforme, GBM as we call it. Um, very popular in the public sphere. Uh, I've had a list of people that have had this diagnosis, many prominent Americans. Oh, yeah, Arizona Senator John McCain, Massachusetts Senator Edward Kennedy, legendary film critic Gene Siskel, former Attorney General, G uh, General Bo Biden, celebrity attorney Johnny Cochran have had uh, a brain cancer. Maybe some of them didn't have GBM, but certainly had the dinosaur brain cancer. So, um, you know, the reality is that a lot of times it takes, it takes for somebody to get a diagnosis, and we see it in the public sphere, and then all of a sudden mm -hmm. it moves people into action. But what do we need to do to not have to wait for somebody that we follow on Twitter or someone that we're affiliated with? To, like, how do we take action without waiting for somebody else to have a diagnosis first, and then we decide to take action? So I'll ask that question to Dr. Schuler first. Well, just to have the public aware that brain cancer does happen, it's not you know it's not as common as the other cancers, but it's definitely there. Uh, yeah, it doesn't take a you know a super popular person to get it just to know it's there. Uh, you know there are other people with big names of Adam and too, and the crazy thing is they don't get better is better you know go do better than anybody else. They're, the data on a GBM is just miserable, unfortunately. And then you know the years that we've been treating it, it, we've made it added months to lives, not like years and years. So, you know, it's, there's research at every major institute. We do research at Northwestern. They were doing research in, in the residency in Oklahoma. You, you know, you've probably heard of the Duke trials and those kind of, they were really big in the news, but they never came up with the, the repeat that actually they weren't working very well. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so, you know, it's every major academic center is doing treatments and trials on, you know, GBM. So it's, it, it's out there. It's, just, yeah, it's not as popular because there's not as many people with it. What's your thoughts, uh, Dr. Broderick, on this diagnosis? Again, like, you know, the idea that, it may take somebody to have something that you found, that you know they found. All of a sudden, you're like, okay, I need to go get checked out. But why do we have to wait for that? Yeah, it's uh, well, it's different, mm -hmm. difficult because the, as we talked about, the symptoms are um, frequently subtle, and um, it takes, uh, and we don't, we just don't hear about it very often. Mm -hmm. We don't have a, 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 a GBM month. We don't see um, NFL players wearing a certain color on a, during a certain month for brain tumor awareness. And so it take, when we, we have a celebrity that has, has it, that's the, the opportunity for the public to become aware of these, of these illnesses. Um, and things that people can do, um, you know, watch for 
opportunities, opportunities to donate to cancer research. Um, certainly brain tumors are an area we need a lot more research, um, especially the, that evil agent GBM that we talk about. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, if the opportunities are there and you see opportunities, um, you know, to, to donate, to walk in a walk, to share something on Twitter, uh, or share something on Facebook, retweet it on Twitter. So there you go. Yeah. My social media. <laughs> there you go. Down. Hey, we're, we're doctors. We're not. We're not really good at the social media <laughs> game. We're just trying to <laughs> learn that a little bit more. Thank Sorry about that, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so you know, anything that we can do, opportunities like right. this, radio shows like this, where we can get the word out um, that the brain tumor community needs help. We need, you know, we need to increase awareness. We need to increase funding. We need to increase research. Um, because that's the only way that we make progress against any of these diseases. Um, but yeah, brain tumor doesn't, we, we don't really get, uh, we don't get a ribbon color. I don't know what no. the brain tumor color ribbon is. There it, needs to be a color. It <laughs> does, that's what it, it needs does. to be. It does, and it's probably out there if anybody does know. Um, <laughs> you've probably seen my Facebook page can, attached to yeah. Dr. G's here. Please <laughs> let me know if you do know the color. Um, I'd like to get a ribbon. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, that's the main yeah. thing that, that you know we can do. Well, we got to do more. There's there's no doubt. You know, one of the interesting things that I was reading as we're preparing for the show that um, you know we've got to do more. And not only just create awareness, which we're trying to do today, and again, I encourage you to share the show uh, to anybody that needs to hear this message. Yes. You know, some of the treatment side was very interesting. In one of the statistics that I read, that that um, there were I'm going to quote this again from the. Uh, National Brain Tumor Society, between 1998 and 2014, there were 78 investigational brain tumor drugs that entered the clinical trial evaluation process. 75 of them failed. That is a 25 to 1 failure ratio in developing new brain tumor treatments over the past two decades. So so we, as clinicians, certainly have an uphill battle, although, as you said earlier, that you're, you're, you're less handcuffed now as you we were, even do. both of you guys, right. as far as some of the operative techniques and some of the techniques that you're trying to do, yeah. just to give people um, continue their, their quality of life, their quality of living, and having high priorities of what they do. So let me ask this question, uh, and then we'll get into the myth versus facts for a second, but uh, we talked a little bit earlier about primary brain tumors. What are secondary brain tumors, and like, where do they come from? Yeah, so yeah. secondary brain tumors are, another word for those are metastases. Okay. So these are cancers that started somewhere else in the body and spread to the brain. Um, unfortunately, it does tend to be, uh, again, a very difficult situation to manage. Again, most of the chemotherapies that we use for the rest of the body do not get into the brain to treat the brain metastases with the tumors that have spread to the brain. It's still the same tissue. It's still the same kind of cancer. If you look at it under a microscope, if it's breast cancer that has spread to the brain, it still looks like breast tissue. It's just in the brain. Um, so, but for whatever reason, we have trouble getting those chemotherapy agents into that, that, uh, um, into that tumor. Now, again, there have been advances in that, in that realm as well. Some of our small molecule targeted agents do cross into the blood brain, cross the blood brain barrier. But in, oftentimes we rely on our surgeons and our radiation doctors because radiation can penetrate the brain. Yes. And obviously a surgeon can get in there. So <laughs> Sh sh shrink something and then you go in there and pluck it out. Right. So well, that's, uh, that's right. often or another way around. We talk, around. you know, we take it out and then the you know, we have the radiation doctors clean up the bed and get all the micro you know, the little tiny cells that are left over, the micro mm -hmm. metastases and they'll clean that up with the radiation. So. Excellent. And today's, you know, today they've come a long way with focused radiation, which is a good thing too. I'm not a radiation doctor, but they've gone from doing whole brain to everybody, which gives people dementia, you know, within time. But now we've got focus where all the radiation just goes to the tumor or to the cavity and people are tolerating it much better. Yeah, and I love that salvaging healthy brain tissue. Yes. Exactly. 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 We don't like irradiating healthy yeah, brain. Yeah. Yeah, so. We can avoid it. Well, this has been great so far, guys. I want to get into some myths versus facts now. So every week on the show, we break down myths versus facts. I say a statement, uh, and then my panel says either myth or fact. We'll be kind of wrap it going a little bit. Uh, but, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll say a statement. I'm oh, sorry. You won't say a statement. I will say a statement. It's my show, guys, darn it. Uh, I'll say the statement, and then you guys basically say uh, myth or fact. And it gives a few sentences of why it's a myth or a fact. But again, we're talking about setting the record straight when it comes to your health. And this is some high yield stuff for you out there. Um, but we want to talk about more. Talking about brain tours, we want to set the record straight. Your answer is not always on Dr. Google. We'd rather have you come in and see us and have, and have us answer your questions. So here we go. Myth versus facts. Hashtag Cancer Sucks Series Part 1. All right. Brain tumors. The first question here, our first statement is for Dr. Schuller. Here we go. The statement. 
The doctors suspect I have a brain. I, sorry, the doctors suspect I have a tumor in the brain. This means I have brain cancer. Myth or fact? That's a myth. Please yeah. explain. Well, uh, yes, you could have a brain tumor, but it also could be like I said from the men, you know meninges was said earlier. So the coverings of your brain can have a tumor. Like I said, ninety-five percent of those are benign. So you not necessarily have cancer. You may have a tumor, which is a mass growing. And unfortunately, in the brain, the one you know one caveat is that it's inside your skull. So it growing, even though it may be not benign, can cause problems. So that's you know it may not be malignant, but it's still a tumor. But yeah, it is a myth that it is cancer. We don't know that until we have a piece of it or what it looks like on the MRI. Excellent. Thank you. Here we go, Dr. Prado. Here we go. Uh, here's a statement. Brain tumor is a long-term consequence of headaches. That's a myth. That's a myth. Please explain. So there are a lot of things that cause headaches. Everything from a beverage or two too many the night before, to dehydration, to, um, uh, to, uh, I'll, I'll, there's, a, there's a million things, yeah, yeah. 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 I get headaches yeah. all the time in, in right. the office, and, and like, it's you know, not again, a Again, the, the, you know, we, as, mm -hmm. as I mentioned, only, you know, 30 out of 100,000 uh, is the incidence, and all of those 100,000 people have had headaches, and some of them have had chronic headaches. The one thing I would say to watch for is a change in headache pattern. If you're a chronic migraine person, and you have a change in, your, in the pattern of your headache, that's something different. If you were not a headache person and suddenly you're having headaches on a regular basis, that's something yes. that's, that's something to watch. And those are, kind of, those are kind of things I want to just pay back. Those are the kind of times when I want people to come and see me right. uh, so we can have that conversation and then I may want to order some neuroimaging, mm -hmm. uh, maybe starting out with a CT scan, mm -hmm. plus or minus MRI, and then go from there. But yes, those kind of things, yes, we want you to come in and be seen. But the headache did not cause the brain tumor. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Myth. Here we go. Statement. <laughs> myth or fact. Here we go. Dr. Schuler. People working in high radiation environments eventually get brain cancer. That's a myth. I mean, yes, if you had specific treatment with radiation in your brain, but otherwise, no. You can radiation cause brain tumors? Yes, but even in high radiation, you're not usually getting enough radiation in your brain uh, to get it. I, I, I use a C-arm all the time, which is a fluoroscopy, which we use radiation. You know, the instance of us getting brain tumors is extremely low. It's the same as the regular population. So Excellent. Thank you. Here we go, Dr. Broder. Here we go. Uh, statement. Brain tumors can have lasting and life-altering physical, cognitive, and psychological impacts on a patient's life. Myth or fact? That is a fact. Please explain. Well, this is a tumor of the brain. The brain controls everything in our bodies. Um, and depending upon where the tumor is and what it's pressing on and what it has damaged, it can cause long-term um, physiologic effects, weakness, numbness, tingling, changes in the uh, vision, um, um, cognitive effects, thinking, um, organization, organizing your life, and then also um, phys uh, psychological effects and effects on the family, effects on caregivers, um, and uh, at any time that a person is not able to do what they used to be able to do. That's a very humbling thing for a patient, and it, it certainly is life-altering. Yeah. I remember on my recovery when I had my resection, or removal, as I tell my wife, because I can't use the word resection in the house, <laughs> because it's too much of a medical word. Uh, but when I, had my, when I had my tumor removed, um, I was just floored. I mean, talking about, I mean, 60, they told me to take three months off. From working now, you know, doctors are the worst patients. You guys will hear me say that all the time. And uh, so I took six weeks off. Thank and then I was good. itching. I had the worst case of Kevin fever. I was I'm like, sure I had to get back and weeks. see some people. And so, but even like those first couple of weeks off, I mean, you could barely even move. Um, and uh, and then my wife would check in on me and she'd call me from work and be like, Did you leave the house today? And I'd be like, No. And then, like, I totally have my fingers crossed because I like, went outside for a walk when I wasn't supposed to. But uh, <laughs> she knows that. She knows I said that before, so it's all good. The all right. I know, the, it's the neighbors. They, know, they right. ratted me out. <laughs> all right. Here we go. A couple more of these things. Here we go. Dr. Schuler, here we go. I like this one. Uh, sleeping with a cell phone next to your head can cause brain tumor formation. No, that's been disproven already. So when so, I sleep so at night, don't cause a tumor. All right, thank you. So when I sleep at night on my phone, on my nightstand, I'm okay. all good. I do the same thing. Okay. Yes, me too. I do it because I'm on call. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Sorry, so thank, you, the job. thank you for setting the record straight. I agree. That is an absolute myth. All right, here we go. Dr. Broderick, here's the statement. Once treated, brain tumors do not recur. Oh, wow. Oh, I wish that wasn't a myth. I, I agree. I wish that wasn't a myth. That is a myth. Unfortunately, um, Frequently, especially the malignant brain tumors, um, they tend to grow back. Um, and even some of the benign tumors, once they've been resected, 
they've been removed. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Tiffany. Tiffany. Moment, yeah, she's, uh, she's good with that one. <laughs> once it's been removed, um, still has the potential for growing back. So it's very important to continue your follow-up with your, whether it's your medical oncologist, your neurosurgeon, uh, neurologist, primary care doctor, whoever is following your tumor going forward, um, you need to maintain uh, contact and you need to be getting your scans when you're told to get your scans and things along those lines. Yeah. Because when they do come back, there are more treatments available. Yeah. I've been, I just been recently graduated, uh, now eight and a half years out from my procedure, but recent, recently graduated that I can take a back seat on some further imaging. But, Excellent. But, uh, but I think, it might, I think it, like, part of me is like, mm, <laughs> just maybe just do one more MRI. Guys, I love getting MRIs done. Well, sure love them. Um, again, a volume will help out, but, right, and so that's right. pretty good. But it does. Yeah. You get that. <sighs> yeah, yeah, you get that ha ah, feeling. Okay. I know, I know. Yeah, and that's that's important too. Let's do one more of these. Here we go, Dr. Schuler. Uh, I like this one. Uh, brain tumors affect women, men, and children of all races and ethnicities. Yes, they do. All that's, right. that's fact. All right, that, thank you. Please explain. Well. The, you know, they hit everybody, and even though meningiomas are more common in women than men, they still hit men. So yeah. it doesn't, like I said earlier, it doesn't discriminate. It hits everybody. It gets kids. It gets adults. It gets older. You know, older populations as well. There's, it, you know, some tumors have come you know, later in life and some earlier in life, but it doesn't discriminate. All right. Thank you very much. There you go, guys. Myth versus facts. Brain tumors. So we got about five minutes left, and we've just had this great discussion. Just really trying to set up uh, um, a foundation for success for people out there mm -hmm. uh, to to have more awareness about this topic of brain tumors that needs to be talked about much more often. Uh, and I'm glad we're talking about it now. So I mentioned at the beginning, we call it the chief complaint because when somebody comes in, you know, when, and when somebody's done with their visit with us, we call it the assessment and plan. And so let's bring it on home. So I'm going to start out with Dr. Schuler. Dr. Okay. Schuler, give us a few take-home points today for people out there listening to us to, to be successful or to learn more. Just things about brain tumors that the public should be aware of, aware about today, whether it's, their, whether it's about their risk or anything like that. But just give us three take-home points to be successful with this topic. Well, I mean, first is live a healthy life. That's the best way to try to prevent these things. Uh, and, you know, don't smoke. You know, yes. exercise that it helps for brain tumors as long as all cancers. Uh, the other thing is, yeah, if you have a change in symptoms, don't sit on it. You know, you start having a numbness in your arm or your hands not work quite right, or people notice, you know, when you're talking, you start going on a different tangent. Let's well, assign something's changed. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean you had a tumor, but it could be you could have a little minor stroke, or you could have, you know, for your arm tingling, you get something wrong in your neck. You know, there's a, lots of different things that follow up with your doctor. You get something new and strange, it's there for a few days, go get it checked out. Because if we can catch things earlier, your prognosis is better quite often. Thank you. Uh, and Please same, keep going. And same thing with the tumors. You catch them earlier, your prognosis is better. And you're, if you're like healthy and you get a brain tumor, you actually actually you recover better when you're healthy. And your expected life is actually longer than someone who comes in in a bad shape. You know they haven't been taking care of themselves and they're you know not been eating and they're malnutrition. They're they're not going to do as well. And, you know, those are the big things. And, I mean, other than that, you know, make sure you just see your doc once a month, once a year, and you're, you know, do what you can. But thank you very much, Dr. Schuler. It's been you're a welcome. pleasure having you on this show, no breaking problem. down brain tumors. So thank you, <laughs> Dr. Broderick. Give us a few take-home points for people to be successful yeah. out there, learn about this topic, or or just be more aware about this topic, or certainly taking action if they're any, if they have any concern about this topic of brain tumors. Yeah. So um, for me, the the biggest take-home for brain tumors is. Um, from a diagnostic standpoint, be aware of your body. Um, you know, headache doesn't mean that you have a brain tumor, but change in headache can. You know, be aware of the symptoms, um, and then from a treatment standpoint, it's a multidisciplinary approach. Um, you want to make sure that you have a team around you um, that sets you up for the best success that you can be. And some of these tumors are benign and have wonderful uh, life expectancies and others are really bad actors, and um, the life expectancy is not very good, but the better the team you have about around you, and the better that that team works together. One of the advantages of our multidisciplinary mm -hmm. clinic is that we're across a conference table from each other. Actually, he and I are next to each other at the conference table. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> Just like that, we're all working yeah, we, yeah, we but, each other. but once a week, we are together, we're looking at the films at the same time, there's nobody interpreting the films differently, there's none of the faxes, phone calls, didn't get his page, couldn't get him on the phone kind of a thing. We're once a week, we're together, we're talking about our patients and a true multidisciplinary approach to the treatment of these tumors. Well, thank you, Dr. Browder, for coming on to the show today. So oh, thank you very much. My so my final thoughts are this. You know, we're talking about cancer, and we're talking about brain tumor state, but we're talking about cancer in a broader perspective. You know, with anything, early diagnosis and treatment is the best thing. 
Don't sit on your symptoms. We've been talking about it all day today. Don't sit on something. If something's out there and it's just different to you, you know, if it lasts for just even just a few days, you know, don't let things last in weeks or months on end. You know, something's just different, but be aware of your body and then call me. Call me, call your primary care physician. That's their entry point to everything. And then if we, if I need to get you to somebody like Dr. Schuler or Dr. Broderick here, then we'll go from there. But I want you never to second, second guess yourself. At the end of the day, cancer is a very difficult topic to talk about, but we have to be comfortable talking about such a difficult topic. So with that being, that being there, I want to just thank my guests. And I tell you what, this has been a great show. I want to thank my guest, Dr. William Broderick, board-certified hematologist, oncologist, co-medical director of the Edward Multidisciplinary Neuro-Oncology Clinic at Edward Elmer's Health, www.eehealth.org. Dr. William Schuler, good friend of mine, board-certified neurosurgeon, Edward Elmer's Health. Check him out as well, too. <laughs> www.eehealth.org. We've got the whole Edward thing going on today. They should, yeah, right. they should give us some acknowledgement on that one, but they have been. <laughs> Thank you, Edward House, so it's all good. Um, there they have. Hey, you guys have been listening and watching live on Facebook and intellectualradio.com. This episode is written by Mark D. Gomez, MD, and Tiffany E.R. Gomez. Producer is Tiffany E.R. Gomez. Music is by the wonderful Mr. Havis. Copyright 2019 by MDG Wellness, LLC. All rights reserved. Stay tuned for my show next week. We're going to continue this cancer sucks series we're going to be doing hashtag cancer sucks part two ovarian cancer and again please be sure to share this show the best thing you can do is share this message to somebody who needs to see it who somebody needs to hear it as well too remember audio replays are available on my website www.drmarkgomez.com at the end of the day let's continue to get healthy together we can do this peace out <laughs>